You are listening to the Motherhood Unstressed Podcast, and I'm your host, Liz Carlisle. Welcome to the show. I'm so glad that you're here. Thank you for choosing to spend your time with me today, and I'm so glad that you did because this, in particular, is a very important show. Whether you have children or not, this information needs to get out to you so that you can live the healthiest life you can live, so that you can protect your children who are essentially defenseless against uh, the food system in America. So it really is about educating you, the mother, the buyer in the home, about what is safe and what isn't and what what is out there that we need to know about uh, so that we can make the right decisions for ourselves and for our families. And today I am speaking with the amazing Dr. Stephen Gundry. He is a four-time best-selling author. He was a heart surgeon for many, many years, pediatric heart surgeon. He has a bunch of patents on all of these different things. He's just incredibly accomplished, and now his life's work is in helping people regain their health through diet and nutrition specifically. And so we uh, delve into what I thought was going to be about lectins, because that's kind of his main thing out there, the most controversial thing that he talks about. Uh, and longevity, because that's his latest book as well. And it kind of just turned into why so many people are suffering today from things like autoimmune disease and leaky gut, leaky brain. Um, What is really going on in America? Why are so many people suffering from obesity, from these things? And it turns out, not surprising, that the powers that be are essentially putting profit over the health of the public. And so we delve into that And it's not just a tirade about how terrible our system is, how corrupt our politicians are. It's more about empowering you, the listener, to stand up and to know what you can do to protect yourself and protect your family. The things that you can do starting today to clean up your diet and choose things that are going to be safe so that your body can heal itself, so that it can detoxify the glyphosate from its system. Um, So I hope that this gets to you at just the right time. If you've been suffering with health issues, I'm so glad that you're here. And uh, even if you're healthy right now, there's always more that we can do to safeguard ourselves, to safeguard our children, because at the end of the day, we are in charge of protecting them. And this is what it's all about, knowing what's out there, knowing what we need to do. And so I hope that this episode empowers you to do that. Thank you. I love you. This episode is sponsored by Motherhood Unstressed CBD. You can pick up your organic, third-party tested CBD in stores around the country or at motherhoodunstressed.com. Well, hello, Dr. Gundry. Welcome to the Motherhood Unstressed podcast. I'm so excited that you're here. Like I said before, before we started recording, I have been catching up on all of your amazing work over the past couple of years and uh, listening to your podcast every time I go to the gym. So welcome to the show. Well, thanks for having me, and I'm very unstressed to be here, so this is great. <laughs> yeah, you don't seem stressed at all. I love it. <laughs> um, but I wanted to kind of dive right in. Essentially, you are a pioneer in the diet and nutrition world. Tell me, how did you come to that revolution? You know, basically, you're trained, you know, in the traditional way. How did that, how did that evolve? Uh, well, real briefly, back in the dark ages, I was an undergraduate at Yale, and in those dark ages, uh, you could actually design your own major. And so, and you, what you had to do is have a thesis and defend a thesis. It'd be like getting a master's degree now. So my major was called human evolutionary biology. And what I wanted to prove was you could take a great ape, manipulate its food supply, manipulate its environment, and prove that you would arrive at a human being. And I successfully defended my thesis and gave it to my parents and went off to become a a famous heart surgeon and kind of forgot all about it. And then fast forward to the late 90s, I was professor and chairman of cardiothoracic surgery at Loma Linda University, one of the pioneers in infant heart transplantation and invented a bunch of stuff. And I met a guy who I call Big Ed in all my books, and Big Ed was in his late 40s, had inoperable coronary artery disease. You couldn't put stents in his blockages. You couldn't do bypasses because everything was clogged up. And Big Ed was a big guy. And Big Ed had been going around the country looking for somebody to operate on him, and everybody said no. And basically he got to me about six months into his 
sojourn. And I looked at his angiogram from six months earlier and I said, eh, no, I'm not going to help you. Sorry. Everybody's right. And he said, well, hold on a second. I've been on this diet for six months and I've lost 45 pounds. And this is still a huge guy, 265 pounds when I met him. And he says, and I've gone to a health food store. And I mean, taking all these supplements. And maybe I did something. And in my heart, and, you know, I'm scratching my professor beard and saying, well, you know, good for you for losing weight, but that's not going to help. And I know what you did with all those supplements. You made expensive urine. <laughs> and I really believe that. And so he said, well, let's do another angiogram. So we did. And in six months' time, this guy cleaned out 50% of the blockages in his heart. Wow. This program. And I'd never seen anything like it. I'd been taught that that's impossible. And when I asked him what his diet was, lo and behold, he starts spouting out basically what my thesis was. And when I asked him, let me look at these supplements you've been taking, I was very famous for protecting the heart uh, for heart transplant by putting chemicals and things into the heart through the veins and arteries. And a lot of the things that he was swallowing was what I was using to protect the heart um, being damaged and it never occurred to me to swallow the dumb things right so i was a big fat guy and uh, you know a heart surgeon was a big fat guy but i was running 30 miles a week going to the gym one hour every day wow. eating a healthy pretty much vegetarian low-fat diet which was the Loma Linda thing and i had arthritis and high blood pressure and pre-diabetes and migraine headaches when i did baby heart transplants and uh, high cholesterol so I put my cell, I called my parents um, and said, hey, do you still have my thesis? And they said, oh, yeah, I've got it here in the shrine, um, <laughs> at, at, you know, the eternal flame. And, and I'm, sure, I'm sure you have and your listeners have a shrine, and I hope you do, uh, for your kids as they grow up. Uh, anyhow, so I put myself on my thesis, and I lost 50 pounds my first year, and another 20 pounds subsequently, and I've kept it off for over 20 years. And what I started to do is put my patients on this program after I operated on them. <clears throat> and lo and behold, their diabetes went away, their high blood pressure went away, their cholesterol changed. And after about a year of doing this, uh, and Loma Linda, I said, you know, I've got this all wrong. Uh, I should be teaching people how to eat first, and then I probably won't have to operate on them. And now that's really dumb as a career move um, because <laughs> a heart surgeon teaching people how to avoid them is, is really pretty dumb. Uh, but I resigned my position at Loma Linda and set up a clinic where I ask people every three months, let me ask you not to eat certain foods. Let me send you to Costco or Trader Joe's. There wasn't an Amazon 20 years ago. And get some supplements. Uh, I don't want to sell them to you. And let's see what happens. And I want to do blood work every three months. And lo and behold, these patterns appeared that, that I've published on. And so for the last 20 years, I've been teaching people how to eat. And more recently, in the last 10 years, uh, much of my work is in autoimmune diseases. I was a very famous transplant immunologist, and I see a lot of kids, which gets us to why we're talking. And a lot of kids with Crohn's disease, with ulcerative colitis, with lupus, uh, juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, uh, all these devastating diseases, which if anybody pays attention to commercials on TV, most of the commercials on TV now are aimed at people with autoimmune diseases because autoimmune diseases have gone from just weird things that we'd see a few times in our lifetime to probably up to 40% of women now have Hashimoto's thyroiditis, which is just crazy. It's and incredible. Yeah, and I so I see all these kids with these problems, and I, you know, started treating all these kids. I was also professor of pediatrics at Loma Linda. I don't know, a lot of people don't know that about me, but uh, American Academy of Pediatric fellow. So, uh, so my my interest in kids spans actually my entire career, but now I've taken a special interest in feeding kids, uh, particularly kids who have been 
at wit's end or families have been wit's end to, you know, get rid of their disease, number one, which the good news is most kids we can get off of their medications and we can get the disease in remission or cure, however you want to use that word. And uh, so... So what is it? What it, What do you think is the driver with all of these autoimmune disease, you know, things happening, but we don't really know what's going on. And, you know, people say, well, the body doesn't attack itself. It's something else. So what is what is causing all of this discord? Well, yeah, I think that's a good point. Um, the, the immune system is essentially doesn't make mistakes, but the immune system is designed to uh, actually look at every protein that enters you, that you swallow, or that gets through the wall of your gut, and decide whether it basically scans a passport, and it decides whether this guy is on the no-fly list or whether it has a valid a passport to enter, that you recognize this protein, that it's a friendly protein, and come on in. On the other hand, if the protein looks unfamiliar or if it's, there's a chance that that protein looks unfamiliar, then the immune system is designed to attack it. And what I and others have found is that there's a class, there's several things. Uh, first, the bacteria in our gut, the microbiome, uh, normally educates the immune system about who's good and who's bad and also educates the immune system about how how excited the immune system ought to be how on guard the immune system ought to be should we be on threat level one or should we be on threat level five an imminent attack and we now know that the right collection of bacteria that we keep happy with food actually tells the immune system, chill out, we've got this, no problem, you know, go, go have a donut. <laughs> so that's, that's number one. Uh, number two, uh, I've gotten very interested in plant compounds called lectins. Lectins are proteins that plants use to defend themselves. And as much as we don't want to believe this, plants don't want to be eaten. Uh, you're a mother. I'm, uh, you know, I'm a father and I have grandchildren now. Uh, we would protect our kids at all costs. And a plant feels the same way. Uh, plants Plants, unfortunately, can't run, hide, fight, but they're chemists of incredible ability. They can turn sunlight into matter, and we haven't figured out how to do that yet. So they make proteins called lectins that are designed to actually do all sorts of nasty things. They make leaky gut. There's absolutely no question about that. By the way, gluten is a lectin, so uh, it's... Um, one of the lectin family, but and we know that gluten, gluten in susceptible individuals, and that's a lot of people now, right. makes leaky gut. And lectins pry the wall of the cells apart in the gut. And then lectins, which are foreign proteins, and bacterial particles leak through the wall of our gut. And our immune system says, oh my gosh, you know, we're under attack. Uh, go to threat level five, scramble the fighter jets. And wherever we see, as we're, the fighter jets are going around our body, a protein that resembles this lectin will shoot to kill and we'll ask questions later. What plants have done, which is just so clever, it's, uh, it's captivating, they make these proteins almost look like other proteins in our body. For instance... These proteins resemble proteins in our thyroid. They resemble proteins in our nerves. They resemble proteins that line our joints, the synovial surface. And they resemble proteins that line the wall of our blood vessels. And so when our immune system is activated by leaky gut or by not being educated by the right bacteria in the first place, the immune system says, oh, you know, that protein in that thyroid looks a lot like a lectin, and this poor woman, I'm going to, sh you know, shoot that protein, and she'll thank me later. And so it's it, basically it's friendly fire. Um, we're, we're trying to protect the individual, but instead we're shooting ourselves in the foot. Now, from a plant standpoint, that's a wonderful thing. 
Because if you hurt or you're tired or you're depressed or you can't get out of bed, you can't go look for a plant to eat. And um, some people go, oh, come on, plants thinking about this? Well, evolutionary pressures happen to plants just like they do to animals. And a plant that has a system that keeps it from being eaten or keeps its babies from being eaten wins. And so that's how it starts. Did the plant think of this? No, uh, we didn't think we ought to become human when we were grade eight. But, you know, these are the things. That, here we are. Yeah, here we are. So that's, uh, that's a long-winded way of saying this is why it happened. Now, antibiotics, uh, speaking to moms, please, 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 please. Antibiotics should be used as a last resort. They are life-saving, but they are not to be given every time you, your child has a sore throat. Thank we're you beginning, that. We're beginning to realize that the vast majority of kid illnesses are not bacterial. They are viral, and antibiotics do not work against viruses. But what antibiotics do is they carpet bomb this incredible microbiome, which is a tropical rainforest of tens of thousands of different species, 100 trillion organisms in our gut. And wherever we take these broad spectrum antibiotics, uh, we not only kill whatever we intended to kill, but we kill everything else. And how and, hard is it to come back from that when you do carpet bomb a child's body? You know, how long does it take before they're back to where they need to be? There, yeah, there are some studies looking at kids and adults with one round of antibiotics. It can take up to two years to have more than one species recover. Now, wow. you go, what? Think about this. Let's say... Uh, we have a forest fire in, in Georgia or here in California, and we have lots of them here in California, and we burn down a forest. Let's suppose the next day we run out and we plant little you know, baby pine trees. It's pretty naive to think that that forest is going to grow back into a mature forest tomorrow. And yet we are naive enough to think that uh, we can carpet bomb our microbiome and then swallow some probiotics and it'll grow back immediately. Um, it takes a while and it takes, again, there's, there's so far there's been 10,000 different species of bacteria identified in our gut. And there's another thousand were identified a few months ago. So we're kind of wow. scratching the surface. And to think that, okay, we're going to take 40 different strains of probiotics and all of a sudden, well, where's the other, you know, 9,999 uh, bugs coming from? So mm -hmm. it's, it's a real problem. And you're, I'm sure, and your listeners are aware that mothers who take antibiotics in their pregnancy or in the delivery room or kids who get early antibiotics are absolutely a setup for obesity. Um, I mean, you can actually, you can do human studies, you can do animal studies, you can make obesity by giving antibiotics to mothers or newborn kids or newborn animals. Um, in, fact, in fact, our entire animal raising industry is based on giving animals low-dose antibiotics to get fatter and bigger quicker. And the moms out there, if they are looking closely, the kids are getting taller and fatter quicker and quicker. Oh, absolutely. And, and what, about, and what about, about eating meat as well that has been fed, you know, the factory farm meat? Is that, are those antibiotics still live in that? Yes. Yeah, yeah, the antibiotics are still there. Mm -hmm. So, you know, every time you have, you know, a non-grass-fed hamburger or a non pasture-raised chicken or a farm-raised fish. For instance, every time you have that wonderful piece of uh, farm-raised Atlantic salmon, those fish are fed antibiotics and they're fed corn and soybeans and that's not fish food. Um, so the whole, you know, everything's shifted to killing off our microbiome, number one. Number two, and this is something that if mothers don't unite uh, something bad, well, it's already happened. Roundup glyphosate 
is now sprayed on almost all conventional crops for harvesting. Most people associate Roundup. We all have Roundup in our garage. Well, I don't, but most of us have Roundup in our garage because we go spray some weeds and wow, look at those weeds, they're dying. Roundup was patented as an antibiotic by Monsanto and it kills bacteria. So every time you eat a Roundup-laden food, you are swallowing antibiotics that kill bacteria. Roundup in itself actually causes leaky gut. Now, the problem is Roundup used to be sprayed on GMO crops, GMO soybeans, for instance. Now, Roundup is sprayed on almost all conventional wheat, oats, rye, soybeans, corn, canola, uh, for what's called desiccation, to kill the plant so it's easier to harvest. So I'm sure your listeners are aware that they recently looked at 33 oat products, including cereals, including granola, including energy bars, and all 33 of them had very high levels of glyphosate. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so, you know, giving your kids a bowl of... uh, I won't use trade names, but uh, little O's that are made out of oats. Um, You are actually killing their microbiome every time you give them a healthy bowl of uh, oats. And it's in our breads. It's in our crackers. It's in our cookies. Um, It's everywhere. It's even in the milk that we drink because these cows are fed corn and wheat and soybeans that have been sprayed with Roundup. And nobody sits there and washes the Roundup off. Uh, And we know that glyphosate is expressed in milk. We know that 93% of breastfeeding mothers have glyphosate in their milk. And, And glyphosate, like I say, we now know it is a cancer causing agent. But I think more importantly, it's one of the reasons we have this epidemic of leaky gut and we have this epidemic of autoimmune disease. So we've we've addressed the problem. It's it's infuriating to me. It makes me want to cry, honestly, because as good, I mean, I'm, I'm on it, organic, everything. As much as I'm on it, I know that my children have been exposed to glyphosate. It's killing them. I mean, I've been exposed. Like, it's just, it's everywhere. It's It's awful. It makes me just want to cry. So we know that that this exists, this problem exists. What is the solution? How can you heal? How can you avoid this in America? Well, so one of the things that's important to realize is it is not hopeless because there are human studies where families were asked to eat organic for two weeks, everything they that went through their mouth. And these, these are people with typical high levels of pesticides, glyphosate, um, heavy metals in their bloodstream. And they were asked to eat organic for two weeks. And the levels of pesticides, glyphosate, heavy metals dramatically decreased. Still, still some there in two weeks. Yeah. So it is possible. Now, you know, in my new book, the, the, the Plant Paradox Family Cookbook, one of the things people say, well, we can't afford to do that. Uh, it's too expensive to eat organic or it's too expensive to cook at home. Uh, in fact, I take care of uh, Medi-Cal patients, Medicaid patients who clearly don't have a lot of income. I take care of a lot of strictly uh, Spanish people, uh, speaking individuals. And they can actually do this. And it's actually remarkably cheap to eat organic as long as the parents take the responsibility for cooking at home. Mm. Fast food is actually incredibly expensive. Uh, it doesn't seem like it, but uh, it's a, there's a profit margin, obviously. And anytime we process food, it's expensive to do. And that processing cost is passed on to the consumer. Um, you can get an instant pot pressure cooker. They're you know, always on sale. Amazon, yeah. It's the greatest invention for working families, working moms that I think has ever occurred. And I mean, you know, I'm not particularly a big fan of beans unless you pressure cook them, but you can 
get beans and some organic vegetables and in 20 minutes you can feed a family cheap right. uh, with a you know instant pot okay. and so these things are done the other thing um i'm not a fan of monster stores like walmart but to their credit walmart is now the largest company that sells organic products in the world over costco over costco wow yeah. Yeah, well, more people go to Walmart than Costco. Hmm. Costco does a great job, don't get me wrong. But these big, you know, these big stores, Walmart, because of their buying power, have pretty much gotten organic uh, vegetables, organic milks, more organic eggs, down to the level of a conventional product. And they've done this because, you know, they can, you know, by price, make farmers plant the way they want and you know farmers like anyone else wants to make a living right and so the important thing is this has to come from people like yourself from your listeners to say look um this isn't 50 years ago when none of this was happening this is now and my kids and me are actively being poisoned um because what's what's good for big agriculture is good for big pharma, and it's actually good for big medicine. Um, and these, if you actually look at the boards of big pharma, big medicine, big agriculture, big chemical, these boards are all they all cross talk. Um, and they're all tied into politics, too. Oh, yeah. Uh, and I talk about this in all my books where if, for instance, Monsanto wanted to keep an arsenic uh, product on the market to feed chickens to keep their flesh color pink, uh, and it was about to be defeated in the Maryland legislature, they made a generous contribution to each of the legislators, and lo and behold, it passed um, to allow it to be uh, continue. Now, it's subsequently been uh, banned, but just shows the power of money. Well, and I think that's why doing this show is so important. Having people like you on the show to offer other solutions, to have that cookbook out into the world, to speak this truth into existence, like that gives me chills. That's everything to me. You know, as someone in your position, you know, you're well known in the community. Have you ever felt pressure from big pharma or these high players to, to be quiet, to stop talking about this? Uh, luckily not, but it's interesting. Um, there are bloggers out there or writers who are actually paid by these companies and they often have very nice looking names you know the the committee for sensible eating um and if you we've started to kind of look at okay where are the paychecks being written and they're written by you know either big food or big pharma interestingly i've, I've started to make uh, dog food and uh, because I have four dogs and I'm the same thing is happening to our pets. Um, our, our pets have arthritis and eczema and, you know, the dogs are in the cone zone and that's the dogs aren't supposed to do that. And we've I've looked at where these recommendations for pet foods come from. And it turns out they come from big veterinary universities, and I won't mention them today. But when you look at the funding of these big, big veterinary universities who recommend foods, so for instance, oh, grains are a healthy part of a dog's diet. I, you know, I have I have four dogs. I have never seen them, you know, look for wheat or oats to eat. <laughs> And when they eat grass, they want to eat grass to throw up. Um, mm -hmm. And that's what they do. So, to, you know, to, to even think that a dog, which is a carnivore, you know, healthy grains, and you see this on TV. And this comes actually from these veterinary schools getting their funding mm -hmm. from big grain companies. And I won't mention those big grain companies, but you can, you can follow. There's only so many. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Take a guess. Right. <laughs> and you can follow the money trail where the funding for this comes from. My wife uh, personally, you know, worries about my safety of somebody, you know, poisoning me. 
Mm. Ah, come on. Uh, although I do have a mirror that I look under my car every day before I start. No, <laughs> I, I just, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm just a little guy, but, I, and it has to be kind of all of us little people just making a stand because we can, we can make a stand with our money. And, you know, if, if son of a gun, if everybody's buying, you know, gluten-free foods that are lectin-free and they're buying organic, then people will start, you know, making these products. Uh, I just interviewed a mom who changed her life from Virginia, and she now has a section of their health food store that is an entire lectin-free section of the health food store. And and so, you know, and she made with her friends the health food store and get this stuff in. And it's there because the buying power um, said, hey, you know, gosh, uh, people want this and we can make some money and it's all good. Right. And when you think about it, it's it's the moms, it's the women who are, you know, with the majority of the buying power and they're making the decisions, they're cooking the food. And I think when you're looking at your child and they're ridden with eczema or they have leaky gut or God forbid leaky brain, which is something that I've been reading about now. Yeah. You, you're not going to let that happen. And it's, it's knowing, it's hearing this interview, this conversation, knowing what the cause is, that you can then make an educated decision and say, I'm not going to put up with this anymore. This is my child. This is my life. I'm done with it. And it just takes that knowing, having that hope. To, when you said this is not a hopeless situation, like that's everything right there. Uh, and I, I talk about in the new book, uh, the, the family cookbook, there's a, a wonderful study that every mom, um, everyone should read, but every mom should read a few, a number of years ago. There's this lovely town in uh, Appleton, uh, Wisconsin, uh, north of Milwaukee. And the Appleton school board said, we're, we're going to do an experiment. We're going to have an organic restaurant in town, make all the breakfasts and all the lunches in this school. We're going to bring all the families in and we're going to teach them what we would like them to do at dinner. And what they looked at, they they looked at behavioral problems in the school. They looked at athletic performance in the school and they looked at truancy rates in the school. And they found with this program that behavior improved dramatically. You know, nobody was going to the vice principal's office anymore. And attendance rates went up and performance on tests went up. And they were so excited that they said, well, you know, we can't just have this nice little, you know, restaurant help us forever. We'll institutionalize this. So we'll bring in one of these big companies that, um, it was actually uh, Marriott host, and we'll contract for them to make the food. No sooner did they do that, that everything returned back to baseline because, quite frankly, they were buying their products from Cisco. They weren't organic. And so, but it's, it's so reflective of what the power of food can do for your child, uh, for your child's learning ability, for your child, for instance, avoiding cancer. As any mom knows, childhood cancer is in, is an epidemic. Uh, when I was in medical school, we maybe had three or four beds in our children's hospital devoted to children tr- children's cancer. It was so rare. Now, you know, we have entire blocks mm-hmm. of children's cancer hospitals. And, uh, and we see these, you know, wonderful ads on TV asking for help. This didn't exist. Mm-hmm. And uh, so moms have got to pay attention. These aren't normal things that are happening to our kids. Right. I think, I think that's huge. I think a wake up call is needed. I think it's happening. I think people are starting to realize and just internally with our own internal knowing that something is not right. And then again, to have people like you speaking the truth and saying, you know, wake up, there are other choices. There are better ways to go about this, to save yourself, to save your children. I mean, that is, it's life-changing. Yeah, it really is. And there's other, you know, easy things that moms can do to, you know, help their children do better in school, for instance. Uh, There's so many really good studies that 
uh, a high quality fish oil, particularly a component of fish oil called DHA. The more DHA in a child's diet, the bigger their brains and the bigger, the better their performance on uh, school tests. Also, the more DHA, the less allergies the child has, the less chance of eczema has. In fact, starting in pregnancy, the more fish oil the mom takes, the better the baby will do in terms of brain development. So, What are, what are your thoughts on heavy metals, though, in fish oil? There is no heavy metals in molecularly distilled fish oil. There's none. Okay. Uh, so just look for the words molecularly distilled. Okay. You're actually, as a, if a pregnant mom, uh, I much prefer pregnant moms taking fish oil rather than eating fish for exactly the reason that you okay. thought. I love it. I love it. Okay. So we have to transition. I want to cover this before our time is up. Your latest book, The Longevity Paradox, all about living well or living old to a ripe old age. What is it? Oh, I love the title. It's hilarious. Die young. Die young. Ripe old age. (laughs) Yes. Um, I find that, that just field of study fascinating. So we've covered the children. Now we're talking directly to the moms who want to look and feel their best for as long as possible. So what are, without giving too much away about the book, what are some main tenets from that book that we can all take home today? So one of the, I think, really important things is that we actually age from the inside out. And one of the things I want people to think about is our, our skin um, is act, the lining of our intestines, which is actually the same surface area as a tennis court. Think about that. Look down in your belly and there's actually a tennis court inside of you. Our <laughs> lining of our intestines is our skin turned inside out. So uh, the intestinal surface is literally a mirror of the skin. And so What goes on at the surface of our intestines, at the lining of our intestines, is reflected in our skin. And I think you were listening to my podcast where Dex Shepard had me on. And right at the end of the podcast, when you get there, he goes, um, let me... Let me look at your hands. You got the hands of a baby. Look, look at your skin. You got baby skin. What the deal? And you know, and you have very nice skin. And, and you're an old fart. What's going on? And so I can actually see a person's inner health by reflection on the skin. So for for all the moms and for all the dads out there, beauty actually comes from inside out. And the more we take care of our inner gut, the more we'll actually see that reflected on our skin. Um, Adult onset acne, rosacea, is actually leaky gut. Uh, Acne is leaky gut. And I've seen so many beautiful, particularly women with cystic acne. When we get lectins out of them, when we get their gut sealed, their cystic acne goes away. it, it's it's really quite remarkable. So that's number one trick. Number two trick. Now this is not to do when you're thinking about getting pregnant or even pregnant. Meal skipping, whether we call this time restricted feeding, whether we call it intermittent fasting, or whether we call it true fasting, the more you can shorten the window in which you eat food, the longer you will live and the healthier you will live. And one of the things, um, if I could convince moms that breakfast is the least important meal of the day, so many of the studies that prompted breakfast is the most important meal of the day were sponsored by the cereal companies mm-hmm. and much of, Kellogg's <laughs> yeah, they were actually mostly sponsored by Kellogg's that's mm-hmm. correct and when if people look and see what Kellogg's have, has done in promulgating this entire idea that healthy whole grains are so good for you um, there's there's for instance the the famous Special K study that Special K helps you lose weight. It turns out that the group that got Special K gained weight, um, but yeah, they actually gained weight. Mm. All of that was cut cut out of this 
study. Um, because, That's incredible. Well, when when a when a company or when a company sponsors a study, most researchers, uh, and I've been a researcher all my life, sign a little waiver that says. I'm going to give you this information and you have the right before it's published to edit. Um, yeah. I don't understand that though. How is that legal? I mean, I mean isn't it, that the whole point of the story for the study? Yeah, it is. But if, uh, you know, I don't, won't talk for everybody, but researchers, you know, have to fund a lab. They have to take, take their kids to college and sometimes I think even in the best of settings you know we go well you know this is an important study and it needs to be done and I'm really not selling my soul to the devil uh, but and I think back in the good old days uh, most of us got our grants from the federal government from the NIH for instance from the American Heart Association from the National Cancer Institute now the vast majority of funds for research comes out of big pharma, pharma. food, big chemical. And most of the funding for medical schools, most of the teaching in medical schools come from these places now. And so, you know, the depths of this just, so the tentacles go so deep. I mean, even the vet schools, you know. <laughs> even the vet schools, exactly the same thing. In your opinion, are there any pure vestiges left in, you know, in any higher education institutions in America? Boy, you know, I don't know. Um, you know, I've, uh, you know, I was a professor for most of my career. I'm not a, a professor in an institution anymore. But there were, uh, quite frankly, there were incredibly good people uh, wherever I was um, that just did great work. But at the same time, uh, I knew of people who uh, had funding for projects for 20 years, and basically nothing changed in their research. And it was just, we're going to tweak one little tiny thing, and that'll keep our funding going. And we all said, man, is this guy good at, you know, <laughs> at tweaking this, this stuff? And, mm -hmm. so, it's a game. It's a game. It's a game. Ugh. I could talk to you for hours. You're so brilliant. You've done so oh, much. No. And I think, I mean, like I said, like you are such a pioneer and I think in so many different ways in the world. So I'm curious about your relationship with your mother, but that's a different show. <laughs> hey, my, you know, I owe, I owe so much to my mother. Um, my mother was actually valedictorian uh, of a class of uh, a thousand uh, students in Omaha, wow. Nebraska. Uh, wow. And this was back in the forties. And you know, I think if things had been different, my, my mother decided to be a housewife, and which, good for her. And she, you know, from day one, uh, I, I was her project, as well as my sister. But uh, every, every night uh, in, in school, you know, she would have flashcards of math problems, of, of words, and we'd sit on the couch and, you know, Wow. Yeah, you know, from day one, and you know, she—I guess she was one of these. Uh, uh, she she was incredibly wonderful, nice person. But she—if you came home with an A minus, uh, it was, you know, what's this? Um, <laughs> you're better than that. Yeah, you're better than that. A minus, and I graduated salutatorian in, in my high school, and uh, you know, I always went, ah, shoot, I should have been valedictorian. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, oh, God. Oh. Yeah, but, but she didn't, you know, she, uh, I mean, she was, she was not demanding that I do things. She was there all the way along, you know, setting me up to succeed. Mm -hmm. And God. I think that's the difference. Um, it's not uh, moms, just from my own mother's standpoint, uh, helping you succeed is the important thing, not demanding that you succeed succeed i think there's a big difference there is there is right because you self-motivated then to do whatever Correct. you wanted to do yeah. yeah yeah that's incredible okay so i have a a few rapid fire questions if you're ready okay. to interview okay true health is oh you know actually i haven't uh, i haven't been told that uh, actually i haven't actually been asked that um true health is 
feeling, being your best self every day. And true health comes from within. Uh, Hippocrates said that all, all disease begins in the gut and that all of us have what Hokey called green life force energy that actually wants to have perfect health. And that there are external factors that keep us from expressing green life force energy. And he believed that the purpose of a physician was to be a detective and find out what the external factors were that were keeping you from having perfect health and remove them. And so that's actually what I do. I'm a detective. And so true health, uh, we all have the ability to have perfect health. And I love that. I get to see it every day. I love that you're doing it. I'm grateful for uh, I'm grateful for my patients. If it hadn't been for my patients volunteering every three months to let me suck a bunch of blood out of them, um, asking me a question that I didn't have the answer for, um, or bringing, you know, a little kid who who couldn't walk uh, at seven years age because his feet and his hands were bloody from an autoimmune disease. And then having him walk in my door six months later with his hands and feet healed. I'm so grateful to be able to see this and learn from my patients. And I've actually dedicated one of my books you know, to my patients. I love that. And last one, what's something that you've learned in life that you wish someone would have told you earlier on? Uh, that most of what you're taught in medical school is incorrect. <laughs> How's that? <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> so how can the listener find you online, get your books, tell us all the things? So you can go to drgundry.com. Uh, I do now have a line of supplements and foods at gundrymd.com. Uh, I have four New York Times bestsellers, uh, which are easy to find wherever you find books, Amazon, Barnes & Noble. Please go to your local bookstore. They're, they are there because they are New York Times bestsellers, so you'll find them. Uh, the new book, the Plant Paradox Family Cookbook, will be out November 19th. Um, Pre-order it now, and you can have it, you know, usually a day or so early, so... Lovely. Thank you so much. This was so eye-opening and motivating, honestly, for me. And I know that the listener now feels more empowered to protect themselves and their family through health. Yeah. And, and you know, and good for you for doing this. Um, you know, moms know there is something wrong. And, and uh, I'm, if I am of any help to guiding is why, where, where this wrongness is coming from, that's what I like to do. You absolutely are. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. You have been listening to the Motherhood Unstressed Podcast, and I'm your host, Liz Carlisle. If you found any kind of value out of this conversation today, please share us on your Instagram stories, tag us at Motherhood Unstressed, and hit those five stars. It literally takes five seconds to do that, and you will feel so good for uh, giving back to the show if we have given anything to you. Have a great week. Love you guys. <laughs>